Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named War of the Worlds, season one and two. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with scientist Catherine, who is a senior expert at the Astronomical Research Institute. One day, she suddenly received an ultra-high frequency signal from outer space. After comparing the data, she confirmed that no natural phenomenon could generate such a signal source. The only explanation was that it was a message transmitted by extraterrestrial life. Her speculation caught the attention of the higher-ups. As it turns out, Catherine was part of a project searching for extraterrestrial life. She had sent music into space, believing it to be a universal language throughout the cosmos. The high-frequency signal received might be a response from extraterrestrial beings. However, the meaning of the message remained a mystery. The bigwigs in attendance wondered if this signal was a friendly greeting or a threatening warning. But Catherine had no good advice to offer and could only dispatch more personnel to continue observations at the research base. That night, the radar detected a large number of objects approaching Earth at a high speed. Before they could react, the unknown objects pierced through the atmosphere, crashing to the ground with long trails of flame. The Institute staff broke out in nervous sweat, but after a few minutes, the catastrophic scenes they had imagined did not occur. The images from the crash sites showed that the fallen objects were small chunks that had only created a few deep pits in the ground. Preliminary estimates indicated there were thousands of such pits. Due to the fear of the unknown, the authorities declared a state of emergency. All schools and airports were temporarily closed, and residents were urged to stay at home. Inspection teams arrived at the crash sites and confirmed that the objects that had hit the ground were spherical metal items, with no biochemical elements detected nearby, only a strong magnetic field. Although no immediate danger was found, Catherine's bad premonition grew stronger. It didn't seem like a friendly way to say hello. She called her sister Sophia and asked her to hurry to the research base, which was relatively safer. Hours passed and the metal objects showed no changes, but the strength and breadth of the surrounding magnetic field were increasing. Catherine speculated that this might be extraterrestrial life scanning the entirety of Earth. However, the colonel felt it wasn't that simple. The metal spheres had all landed in densely populated areas, which could indicate an unknown weapon. At this moment, all the detection data had been uploaded to the server. Professor Bill, who specializes in electromagnetism, was staring at his computer. He had once conducted a study and found that induced currents could affect human brain activity. If the magnitude was large enough, it could potentially be life-threatening. Now, as the electromagnetic field of the metal spheres was growing stronger, Bill theorized that humanity might be facing an imminent catastrophe. The first thing he did was call his son, who worked at the Department of Defense, and suggested that he urgently evacuate residents to basements or metal structures. However, this was clearly beyond his son's authority. The head of security thought the cost of evacuation was too high, and citing a lack of concrete evidence, dismissed the evacuation proposal offhand. But the son had a lot of faith in his father. After much contemplation, he posted a message on his social media platform warning that Earth was about to be attacked. But his warning was hardly necessary. Many residents were already on edge. Meanwhile, housewife Sarah had called her traveling husband to arrange a meeting at her grandfather's house in the distant suburbs. The streets were already clogged with vehicles, making Sarah's family's progress virtually impossible. While discussing whether to leave the car, a bright light suddenly appeared in the sky, a result of the strong magnetic field affecting the atmosphere, indicating that a greater disaster was about to strike. Pedestrians on the road started to panic. Sarah knew she couldn't wait any longer. She stepped on the gas and headed for the underground parking garage nearby. After a swift drive bypassing the congested roads, she quickly got out of the car and following the disordered crowd, ran towards the underground station. Just then, a colonel at the Astronomical Research Institute discovered that all the reconnaissance planes had crashed without explanation. Shortly afterward, the lights began to flicker. Catherine sensed that something was wrong and quickly called her sister to ask about her whereabouts. But at that moment, Sophia was stuck in traffic, unable to move. Catherine told her to get out of the car and look for shelter to hide in. Right at that moment, the phone signal cut out and the electricity at the base started to become unstable. The colonel hurriedly evacuated everyone to the underground bunker. On the other end of the line, Sophia, still puzzled, looked up to see the brightening magnetic glow in the sky. Cars on the road suddenly stopped running, and without a second thought, she started to run for her life. In the next instant, the power throughout the entire city went out. The world seemed to hit the pause button, and an eerie silence fell. 
Time passed, indeterminate in length, when a man named Machar emerged from a tanker truck. A graveyard of wrecked cars stretched out as far as the eye could see. The once bustling roads were now deathly quiet. It seemed that Professor Bill's prediction had come true. The metal spheres scattered across the city had released a powerful electromagnetic field that claimed nearly every life. The disaster had arrived silently, but the trauma it inflicted on humanity was immeasurable. The surviving Machar was lucky. It turns out, while attempting to steal at the port at night, he was discovered by a guard and hid inside an empty tanker truck, inadvertently escaping the electromagnetic disaster. Similarly fortunate was Sarah's family, who managed to survive in the subway station. At dawn, they followed the crowd onto the streets, only to be chilled to the bone by the sight of bodies scattered everywhere. They finally got into a car, only to find it impossible to start. Sarah had to keep walking. She was still determined to go to her grandfather's house because she had arranged to meet her husband there, even though she had no idea if he was dead or alive. A few of them had walked the whole morning and just happened to pass by a store with a broken door. They thought they'd fill their bellies before anything else, but they didn't expect to find two dead bodies lying there. The group was pretty numb to the sight by now and were about to pack some grub to go when one of the supposed dead suddenly cried out for help. On closer look, it was Mashar who had survived in the oil tanker. He had beaten Sarah's family to the store, looking to stock up on supplies when out of the blue, the storekeeper appeared and pounced on him. Machar shot back, taking out the storekeeper but getting stabbed in the belly himself. Luckily, Sarah's family came by and he asked for help straight away. Sarah looked uneasy, knowing how hard it was just to keep herself safe, let alone rescue someone. Her daughter, Emily, gave the man a bottle of water and promised to find help, but he could tell Sarah was itching to leave and quickly grabbed Emily to force Sarah to find a doctor. Sarah's mother agreed, but as soon as the man let Emily go, Sarah took the chance to bolt with Emily. Maybe Mashar had figured that Sarah's family wouldn't be coming back with any help. Astronomer Catherine had also left the safety of the shelter by now. Even with the generators running, they were cut off from command. The radio was occasionally picking up some odd noises, which the colonel ventured might be alien signals. Catherine was now in a rush to find her sister Sophia, who was now her only kin after their parents had died. Upon reaching a snarl up on the road, she spotted Sophia's car, but was relieved not to find her sister's body. She figured Sophia must have taken her advice and hidden in a cave somewhere nearby. Heading off into the forest in search, Catherine didn't find her sister but stumbled upon a little girl who had survived a close call in a cave, though her parents were missing. Catherine couldn't bear to leave the child alone, so she decided to bring her along in the search for others. Out of the woods, suddenly came several figures. It was the colonel and his men who were convinced they needed to get back to base before the next wave of electromagnetic attacks. Catherine was adamant about finding her sister, and the colonel had no choice but to continue the search with her. After a tough climb to a cliff, they scoped out a supermarket through a powerful lens and saw people looting it wildly. Catherine suspected her sister might be there and thought it was essential to check it out. But upon arrival, they realized something was amiss. The looters had vanished, the area was deathly quiet, and there were lingering bloodstains. The soldiers on edge divided into teams to scout the area. Two of them discovered a room full of corpses, the blood on them indicating they hadn't fallen victim to the electromagnetic attack. At the same time, a soldier standing guard outside was suddenly shot and fell to the ground. The rest of the soldiers opened fire in retaliation, but several went down without even catching a glimpse of the assailant. In the ensuing chaos, Catherine took the little girl and hid inside the supermarket, only to become a target themselves. Just as she felt a threatening presence drawing closer, a burst of gunfire sounded. It was the colonel and his troops arriving just in time. That's when Catherine realized the girl was gone. She desperately began to search and didn't know the girl had hidden herself in a freezer. But in the next instant, the freezer door swung open, and when everyone followed the sound to the freezer, they found the girl had turned into a frozen body. Sensing too much danger here, the colonel ordered an immediate retreat to the base. But the shadow hanging over everyone wouldn't dissipate. A mysterious power attacked Earth, erasing most living beings in a flash. But it turned out this was merely the beginning. A slaughter monster somehow emerged and began hunting the remaining survivors. Catherine and the soldiers met this creature for the first time and took a hard hit, ultimately forced to beat a hasty retreat. Everyone was filled with uncertainty, wondering if these alien beings truly intended to annihilate all humans. It was then that they received a different kind of high-frequency signal from the aliens, this time interspersed with melodious music. 
Catherine shuddered upon hearing it because this tune was all too familiar to her. It was the same one they had sent into space in an attempt to reach out to extraterrestrial life. This indicates that the extraterrestrials found Earth by tracing their previously sent signals. They never expected they would make a grave mistake, but now they faced the consequences. The immediate concern was how to rectify the situation. Catherine was confident that she could determine the extraterrestrial's location on Earth by tracking the signal source. All that was needed was to fit an additional positioning system onto the receiver. The guards wasted no time and got to work vigorously. Once all preparations were complete, the positioning equipment began to operate. Catherine processed and filtered the signals until the source's location was finally pinpointed. Initially, the source seemed to be moving, but then it stopped at a set of coordinates. The colonel quickly consulted the map and was surprised to find the coordinates were near this canyon, telling that the extraterrestrial life might have located this research base through reverse detection. He knew he had to take his team to the coordinates to see for themselves. Catherine was curious about what the aliens looked like and decided to join them on their mission. The team was fully prepared and left the research base in a formidable procession, following the designated coordinates. Before long, they found themselves in a forest where an eerie silence pervaded. The colonel sensed something was amiss and signaled for everyone to halt. However, a muffled grunt sounded in the next moment as one of the soldiers was shot and fell to the ground. The rest of the team quickly returned fire, clearly walking into an ambush. Fighting while retreating, they didn't stop until they were out of the woods, where the robot dog-like creature could no longer pursue them. After this attack, the colonel suffered the loss of several more soldiers. Although Catherine was unharmed, she was shaken by the ordeal. It was obvious that these alien beings were highly intelligent and adept at setting traps. Fortunately, they were not the only surviving official organization. The defense headquarters, known for its stringent security measures, had its personnel successfully evade the initial electromagnetic attack. Even the family members of the staff had taken refuge there, but they, too, were unable to make contact with the outside world. Unable to bear it any longer, the minister arranged for a limited guard force to go out and scout. Perhaps they were unaware that the moment they opened the protective iron gates, the defense base would also face an overwhelming catastrophe. Meanwhile, Professor Bill and his wife were on their way to the Defense Department, intending to reunite with their son who worked there. Bill, having been one of the first to detect the electromagnetic disaster, naturally had a knack for avoiding it. After successfully escaping a close call in a sealed elevator with his wife, his only concern was for his son. When the elderly couple arrived at the defense headquarters, they were shocked to find the ground littered with soldiers' bodies and the base gates wide open, clearly overrun by alien life. Ignoring the danger, the old lady hurried inside to look for their son, only to find a scene of devastation similar to the outside. Suddenly a noise came from a compartment, and Bill, driven by curiosity, silently unlatched the door. A robot dog sprang out. Bill stumbled backward in fright and was quickly overpowered. This must be the tool the aliens used to clear out the surviving humans. Its gun muzzle kept moving, likely because it had run out of bullets. Suddenly, gunfire rang out and the robot dog lay motionless. It's his wife who had come to the rescue. Soon after, shouts came from the end of the corridor. Surprisingly, the minister had survived, but her eyes were filled with despair, for everyone in the bunker, including her two children, had perished. Bill's wife, somewhat nervously, inquired about her own son. After hearing his name, the minister said he had escaped with a group of people. Relieved, the two promised to help the minister bury her deceased children. However, when everything was ready, the minister requested to be buried alongside her children, revealing she had no desire to live in this world any longer. Bill and his wife were saddened, knowing they couldn't dissuade this determined woman. A crisp gunshot echoed through the silent corridors, carrying with it endless sorrow. After taking care of the minister's family, the elderly couple returned to the base corridor. Bill was curious about the alien creature they had killed. Despite its metallic exterior, it was filled with organic tissue resembling a primitive nervous system. The professor was puzzled, wondering with such advanced technology why the aliens would use such a primitive combat tool. However, he couldn't dwell on this now, as he needed to find his escaping son first. Unexpectedly, when Bill went out, he accidentally discovered his own son dead by the side of the road, clearly having not escaped the pursuit of the robot dogs. The old couple's hearts were shattered by their son's death. After regaining some composure, his wife said that since the robot dogs had organic components, Bill must have a way to exterminate them, leaving none behind. The child's death had clearly enraged this mother. 
Bill promised her, but to research weapons to combat them, they needed to find a suitable lab. And so, the old couple set off on their journey once again. On the other side, Sarah's family was on their way to her grandfather's house, having also endured many hardships just to reunite with her husband. While passing a hospital, a doctor suddenly ran out with an urgent look on his face, pleading for Sarah's help. Despite really not wanting to, especially in front of her two children, Sarah patiently entered the hospital. To her surprise, there were quite a few survivors inside, but they were all patients with mobility issues, and the doctors and nurses had long since run back to their homes. While talking, they reached the end of a corridor where many newborn babies lay in a room. After the electromagnetic disaster, they had all become orphans, looked after voluntarily by this doctor who could no longer cope alone, which is why he asked Sarah for help with the children. This was not a difficult task for her as a mother. Instead, it sparked the glow of maternal love in her heart, and she no longer spoke of leaving. Just then, Sarah's son hurried over, saying he had seen an old acquaintance. They went to the corridor and saw it was Mashar, the injured survivor they had encountered in the store. Sarah was unsettled, obviously still concerned about the incident where the man had taken her daughter hostage. The doctor came out to mediate, pointing out that it was he who had brought the unconscious Mashar to the hospital. This left Sarah speechless, knowing that she had once been indifferent to Mashar's fate. Her daughter Emily approached Mashar to offer an apology. Seeing this, Sarah still wanted to advise her daughter to keep her distance from him. Suddenly, gunfire erupted outside the hospital. Machar sensed trouble and urged everyone to seek refuge in the basement. Despite his injuries not fully healed, he took out his weapon and stood guard in the hospital lobby. The astute Emily realized that the gunfire was not just a simple conflict. She curiously peered out from an upstairs window and saw several robot dogs approaching the hospital. Machar quickly became aware of the danger. Confronted with these bizarre adversaries, he dared not make any move, instead hiding behind the counter and holding his breath as they entered the hospital. He went to inform Sarah and the others, not forgetting the doctor in the baby room, but he couldn't find him. For safety, he secured the door with several locks to keep the robot dogs out. After finally finding the dozing doctor in the corridor, he frantically dragged him towards the hospital exit. By then, the robot dogs had begun their slaughter, leaving those with limited mobility without any chance to escape. Chicken screams then filled the hospital. The doctor intended to go back to protect the infants, but was forcefully pulled away by Machar. Sarah's family hid in an office and evaded several waves of pursuit, narrowly avoiding a direct encounter with the robot dogs thanks to a sudden change of direction at the last moment. They all met at the entrance, but the doctor still worried about the infants and wanted to go back to save them. After being scolded by Sarah, he sheepishly ran towards the street. Fortunately, Machar had previously barricaded the baby room door. Although the prowling robot dogs heard the crying, it was unclear whether they would force entry. After a night on the run, Machar and Sarah's family found an unoccupied office to rest in. Unbeknownst to them, the doctor, still concerned about the infants, stealthily took Machar's handgun while he was asleep and hurried back towards the hospital. When Machar realized the doctor was missing, several hours had passed. In a way, the doctor was his lifesaver, so Machar felt compelled to go to the hospital to find him. As night fell, Machar once again arrived at the eerily quiet hospital. All the patients had perished, but thankfully, the murderous robot dogs were gone. Machar groped his way through and safely reached the baby room, only to find the doctor sitting on the bed, distraught. Machar was dumbfounded to see all the infants had vanished, presumably taken by the robot dogs. When Machar and the doctor realized something was amiss, they immediately fled the hospital. But they hadn't gotten far when they were targeted by alien slaughters. The two were forced to hide in a small car, holding their breaths and watching in shock as robot dogs leaped over the car roof until they disappeared from view. Only then did they continue to walk on the desolate streets. Unexpectedly, they encountered an elderly couple en route. It was Professor Bill and his wife. It was surprising to find that they had left the defense base and even brought the corpses of the robot dogs with them, planning to head to the school lab to research ways to combat the alien creatures. Machar knew the streets were too dangerous at the moment and decided to take Bill and his wife back to the safety of his apartment first. Sarah's son, Tom, was extremely curious about the robot dogs, and Professor Bill was patient in explaining. By observing their neuronal density, it became clear that the robot dogs didn't seem to be intelligent alien beings, but rather more like controlled killing machines. 
the real mastermind had to be someone else. Bill noticed the ring-shaped mirrors embedded in the heads of the dogs, suggesting they might be used to receive external signals similar to eyes. Tom suddenly remembered that his sister Emily, who used to be blind, had regained her sight intermittently since the alien invasion and could also hear sounds that others couldn't. Upon hearing this, Professor Bill thought if there could be a connection. As they spoke, Emily, who was previously blind, suddenly walked out of the room and approached the corpse of the robot dog. She said she felt the presence of something on the table. Professor Bill looked at Emily in astonishment. This was beyond any current scientific explanation. The doctor interjected, saying that the robot dogs had taken several infants from the hospital. What's more, the dogs didn't even spare pregnant women. They were after the unborn children. Afterward, the doctor rushed to inform everyone that the robot dogs had located their position. Clearly, they couldn't stay put any longer. The group packed their bags and hastened outside. Unexpectedly, Emily once again heard the mysterious sounds and her vision returned. But in the next moment, a robot dog appeared out of nowhere, causing everyone to gasp in shock. Only Emily at the forefront waved her hand, signaling everyone to stay still. Strangely, the robot dog stopped upon approaching Emily and then left without any sign of malice. This left everyone dumbfounded, and Professor Bill became even more convinced of Emily's extraordinary nature. However, a thorough examination of her eyes revealed nothing unusual. At this moment, Sarah decided to head to the school lab with Machar, Professor Bill, and others, abandoning the plan to reunite with her husband for the time being. She knew that just the three of them, mother and children, would inevitably encounter trouble on the streets. The group, carrying the robot dog's carcass, set out for the lab. The sight of the ravaged surroundings weighed heavily on their hearts. They were acutely aware that sticking together was the only way to avoid becoming lost souls on the streets. Fortunately, it wasn't long before they arrived at the school where the professor worked. The place had a generator for power and plenty of unused rooms, making it an ideal refuge. But what the professor loved most was the fully equipped lab. He removed the robot dog's eyes and discovered that it was a high-precision detector with a string of binary code etched on its surface. After decrypting the code, he was astonished to find that it was a rearranged sequence of genetic fragments. It was unexpected how advanced the alien's research on the human body was. When he went to share this news with his wife, he discovered that she was not in their quarters. It turned out that the old lady had learned from Sarah that it was her son Tom's birthday today. Despite the apocalypse, she couldn't help but say that one should not neglect the love and care for one's child. So the two mothers quietly stepped out onto the street, intending to prepare a birthday gift for Tom. But in a large garage, they suddenly heard cries for help. Upon rushing over, they saw a robot dog dragging a pregnant woman. At the crucial moment, her husband used a gun to attract the robot dog's attention, giving the woman precious time. Sarah and the old lady appeared just in time, helping the pregnant woman to escape at full speed. They barely managed to find a small van and jumped in without a second thought. Unfortunately, they still encountered the robot dog, but they managed to drive it under the vehicle. Tragically, the pregnant woman stopped breathing due to a gunshot wound to the head. When the two returned to the school, they quickly cleaned off the bloodstains and mysteriously brought Tom to a room that had been prepared in advance. The room was filled with companions, and a birthday cake and gifts were all set. A unique birthday party began. Even under the toughest conditions, they do not abandon their spirit of optimism and hope. Equally relentless were the astronomer Catherine and the guard soldiers. Previously, they had narrowly escaped an ambush by the robot dogs. After a night's rest, they finally managed to deal with the aftermath of the fallen soldiers. Catherine suggested that it would be best to return to the Research Institute's base, as moving forward was too dangerous. However, the colonel disagreed. Their mission was to search for the source of the alien signal, and if they gave up halfway, the soldiers' sacrifices would have been in vain. The group set off again, heading deep into the forest. They soon arrived at a clearing that had been scorched by a large fire, resembling the ruins left after something had exploded. The colonel was certain that this was the coordinates where the signal source had vanished. At his command, all the soldiers began searching the area. Catherine discovered organic tissue among the debris, feeling like it was the scene of an alien spacecraft crash. While she was in thought, a robot dog passed by, staggering as if blind, showing no intention of attacking. 
The colonel curiously followed it and noticed more robot dogs moving in circles, seemingly disoriented. Catherine speculated that the explosion might have damaged their sensors. At that moment, gunshots were suddenly heard nearby. It turned out to be soldiers toying with the unresponsive robot dogs, clearly loathing these creatures. The colonel did not join in the venting but continued his thorough search of the surrounding area. Finding no trace of the alien signal source, the group had no choice but to leave, planning to return to the research base. As the sky darkened, the group arrived safely. But as they entered the base, they spotted a shadow moving at the end of the corridor. It was only upon closer inspection that they realized it was a human figure. Catherine immediately recognized it was her sister Sophia, whom she had been searching for. Early in the electromagnetic disaster, Sophia had followed her sister's advice and hid in a mountain drainage outlet, escaping calamity. When she saw the highway littered with bodies, Sophia realized the severity of the situation and couldn't help but tremble. On her way to her sister's research base, Sophia stumbled upon a camper van. While gathering supplies, she discovered a surviving little boy inside, incessantly crying about monsters. Sophia didn't understand what he was referring to, but could not bear to leave him behind. So she decided to take the boy with her. Little did they anticipate that not far out, they would encounter the monsters the boy mentioned. Sophia quickly hid him under a cable car seat. As the robot dog approached near, she had to make noise to divert its attention. At that critical moment, a gunshot sounded and a strange woman appeared, seemingly collecting survivors. She hurriedly led Sophia and the boy to a community. It's surprising to find that many survivors still live in the basement here, but food is extremely scarce. The men who go out to gather supplies are dwindling by the day. Before long, everyone is unable to hold on. Sophia thought of her sister's research base, which has enough armed protection for everyone. So early the next morning, she brought the little boy to the research base, just in time to encounter the returning main force. The sisters were overjoyed to see each other again. However, Sophia was still preoccupied with the condition of the survivors in the community and hoped her scientist sister could offer help. Catherine had no choice but to consult with the colonel, who quickly showed a troubled expression. At this point, he also couldn't get in touch with the headquarters. With only a few soldiers, the risk was significant to go there rashly. Although Catherine understood, she still felt a bit disappointed. Just then, a flock of birds flew past the window in neat formation. Catherine realized that these birds rely on the quantum properties of their cells to fly in formation. So she deduced the alien creatures might be the same. Perhaps when searching for the alien signal source earlier, it was the radio frequency that disrupted the navigation of the alien spacecraft, causing it to crash in the forest. And the reason those robot dogs became unresponsive was due to the crash of the spacecraft that commanded them. However, it's unknown how many such spacecraft there are. Catherine proposed that if they could use signal interference to sever the connection between the spacecraft and the robot dogs, then all of them would become sitting ducks. The colonel thought the method was feasible, so the next morning they set off in grand fashion, ready to head to the community to rescue the survivors and also to test Catherine's hypothesis. This could be the key battle in defeating the alien creatures. The soldiers were ready for battle, silently marching through the dark forest. Suddenly, several soldiers' bodies appeared on the path ahead, along with a pile of scattered shell casings, clear signs they had encountered an ambush by alien creatures. The soldiers did not linger long and pressed forward as they had an even more important mission, to rescue a group of survivors trapped in the community. These people had been staying in the basement for nearly a week, watching their supplies run out, and they didn't dare to wander outside carelessly, as the outside was full of predatory alien creatures. Fortunately, the soldiers arrived in time. The commander instructed everyone to pack up quickly, and in two hours, they would all move to the research base's shelter. All the survivors were immediately invigorated. They had long wanted to leave this dark and sunless haunted place. The time to depart was fast approaching. The colonel had already taken some men to guard the door in advance, fearing an attack by alien creatures. Unfortunately, things didn't go as hoped. A guard suddenly fell to the ground, shot. The alien creatures had found them after all. The colonel ordered a counterattack while sending a few of his men to retreat into the basement, secure the door and ensure the survivors' safety. Meanwhile, he himself stayed to engage with the robot dogs, hoping to annihilate them quickly. But the enemy forces invading this time were sizable, and the military's numbers were dwindling. Even Sophia was accidentally shot and fell. As the enemy closed in, everyone was in a state of panic. Catherine remembered her earlier speculation and hastily took out a small signal transmitter from her backpack. 
She hoped the emitted frequency could disrupt the connection between the robot dogs and the alien command system. At that moment, the robot dogs began to hammer at the basement door, with all the survivors' shitty lives hanging by a thread. Catherine was still frantically adjusting the frequency. As each second passed, another soldier fell. Just as a robot dog reached her sister, Catherine finally completed the frequency adjustment. A high-frequency signal was emitted, causing the robot dogs to begin to spin in place, ignoring the humans around them. Undoubtedly, Catherine's experiment was a success. The survivors had narrowly escaped disaster and began their slow journey towards the research base under the protection of the few remaining soldiers. The colonel was also full of confidence, knowing that since they had found a way to fight the alien creatures, humanity would one day be victorious. Meanwhile, Professor Bill in the lab, still searching for the alien creature's weaknesses, wasn't having as much luck. His only finding was that the aliens were studying human genetic sequencing and had made significant progress. The abduction of infants and pregnant women was a clear indication of this. Machar, keeping watch on the balcony, had a growing sense that time was running out for everyone as gunshots were constantly heard nearby and soldiers could even be seen. He believed staying here was no longer safe and perhaps the military's counterattack against the aliens was about to begin. But everyone present was reluctant to leave, thinking there was not any other place safer than here. The professor sought out Emily alone, hoping to find some answers from this special girl. But this time, it seemed he had approached the wrong person. She had inexplicably regained her sight and somehow shared a connection with the alien life forms. Vaguely, it was as if she saw the alien beings approaching her, but when she came to her senses, they had already vanished. Then, in the middle of the night, that familiar voice called out again. Curious, Emily stood up and walked towards the source of the sound. Sure enough, the alien creature appeared again. Emily felt no fear. Instead, there was an inexplicable sense of kinship. Compelled, she reached out to touch it, but at that moment, a loud gunshot rang out. It was Bill's wife, who had suddenly appeared on patrol and was killed by a robot dog. Emily tried to intervene, but it was futile. She could only watch as the robot dog killed the old lady. When everyone rushed to the scene, they found only the old lady in a pool of blood and a trembling Emily. Clearly, no one had anticipated this tragic turn of events. The old professor sat on the ground, weeping at the loss of his wife. After this incident, everyone's attitude toward Emily changed. They wondered why the old lady died so horribly, yet Emily was unscathed. Could it be that she was in league with the alien beings? Emily, clearly unable to accept the suspicions from those around her, decided to calm down alone. Professor Bill was never able to get over the sudden death of his wife, but he had not completely given up. He prepared to lay his wife to rest. The doctor went to help. Each shovelful the professor dug felt like a painful strike to the depths of his soul. Suddenly, an emotionally distressed Emily saw the robot dog appear again. It felt as if it had come for her, so she quietly walked outside the school. Machar, keeping watch on the rooftop, saw Emily walking alone into the street and quickly followed her. But by the time he caught up, she was already beside the robot dog, sensing no malice from it. Emily reached out to touch it and felt as if she had entered another world. A handsome boy was caressing her swollen belly, but in the next instant, the vision disappeared, and the robot dog turned and left. It turned out that Mashar had come after her. However, Emily seemed to have an epiphany, firmly believing that the alien creatures must be trying to convey some message to her. She decided to go to their lair to find out the truth. Mashar tried to dissuade her, but she was unmoved, so he had no choice but to accompany her on this risky journey. With Emily present, the path was surprisingly smooth. The robot dog stepped aside upon seeing them. In her view, these alien creatures were not to be feared. Instead, they seemed to be leading the way. While everyone at the school was preoccupied with taking care of the old lady's affairs, only Sarah noticed the note left behind by Emily. She realized her daughter had already left and wanted to go after her, but her son Tom still needed her care. Sarah reluctantly abandoned the thought of chasing after Emily. Just then, the sound of breaking glass echoed from the corridor outside. It was clear that an alien creature had broken in. Staying put was obviously unwise, so Sarah hurriedly took her son to leave through the front door. However, the sounds of intense fighting were coming from the entrance as well, forcing mother and child to escape through the underground garage. They hadn't gone far when a group of soldiers suddenly appeared. Sarah and her son quickly raised their hands in surrender, observing that the soldiers seemed to have been driven here by the alien beings. At this time, Emily and Machar had already reached the city center. Several robot dog carcasses hung from the overpass, a clear sign that conflict here had been fierce. Emily cast a sympathetic glance before continuing on their way. 
Unintentionally, the pair reached a bridge where a huge building floated on the river, which Emily felt must be the central hub of the alien life. Politely declining Machar's offer to continue together, she mustered strength in her legs, vaulted over the handrail, and leaped onto the structure. Not far ahead was a conspicuous entrance. Once Emily crawled through, she found herself in a closed, elongated space. The entire corridor was narrow and dim, but she moved forward. Here she saw many infants, though their purpose was unclear. Continuing on, Emily found a massive container at the end of the corridor. Approaching it curiously, she didn't expect a withered hand to reach out from within. The girl's face showed utter amazement because a living human being was lying there. Emily, who shared a special connection with the aliens, inadvertently discovered that these so-called aliens had the same physique and appearance as humans. In the moment their hands clasped, Emily's mind was flooded with miraculous visions of a land unlike Earth. Aliens, in agony, hurled their dead into a river, clearly facing a catastrophe. It was then that Emily jolted awake to find the woman from her hallucination standing before her, with a circular tattoo identical to her own on her hand. Frightened, Emily rushed outside, only to be blocked by two robot dogs. Suddenly, her surroundings began to shake. It turned out her spaceship was taking off. Machar watched the scene before him in disbelief. The scene shifts to six months later. Under the oppression of the aliens, the remaining human survivors began to fiercely resist. Sarah became a nurse, while Professor Bill made significant headway in his research on the aliens. They retrieved several alien bodies from the river, whose appearance was similar to humans, but with unique genetic mutations causing multiple organ failures and even disabilities. This was why they relied on robot dogs to hunt. The professor speculated that the aliens were abducting infants to use their embryonic stem cells to perfect their own genetics. Over the past six months, he had developed a prototype biological weapon based on alien genetic traits, now in the clinical trial phase. If successful, it could potentially eradicate all the aliens. Now, a golden opportunity presented itself. A damaged alien spaceship had crash-landed in a nearby river. If they could capture a few aliens alive for experiments, the success of the biological weapon was highly likely. Machar and the doctor were ready, leading an armed group of survivors towards the spaceship. They had also mastered the use of electromagnetic interference to immobilize the robot dogs. As Machar and the others reached the riverbank, they saw several robot dogs prowling in the distance. Everyone held their breath, waiting for the electromagnetic interference to be adjusted. Machar, hidden under a vehicle, grew tense as a robot dog calmly approached. But at the critical moment, the electromagnetic interference was successfully emitted, disabling the creatures. Everyone began to beat the incapacitated enemy with ease. After disposing of the foes, Machar had the doctor and a few others stand guard outside while the rest of the troops cautiously entered the spaceship. The group stared wide-eyed at everything around them. They were surrounded by dark metallic walls and scattered mechanical arms. Surprisingly, there was no sign of aliens. It felt like an abandoned ship. The group dispersed to search and astonishingly found an unconscious woman in a seat. Tom figured out it was his sister, Emily, who had been missing for six months. Machar also recognized her and hurriedly unbuckled her seatbelt, preparing to take her away. Meanwhile, outside, the doctor and the others on watch were suddenly under mysterious attack. Everyone immediately fought back. Machar, rushing out, saw the only fallen attacker. It was unexpected. The aliens had joined the battle themselves. It was clearly a well-planned ambush, with aliens already positioned at strategic high points around the streets. All the surviving humans could do was run for cover as more and more fell. Fortunately, it seemed they spared Emily, not firing at her. In just over ten minutes, the ground was littered with the bodies of survivors. Only a few managed to escape back to their dwelling, all injured. The hall was filled with cries of despair. Sarah was sweating with worry until she saw her son Tom unharmed, which finally set her heart at ease. What delighted her even more was the return of Emily after half a year. Tears of relief rolled down the old mother's cheeks. But this joy could not mask the defeat suffered in the battle. The survivor's leader, Zoe, was immersed in deep guilt. She thought that by dealing with the robot dogs, they could rest easy. The professor wondered if the aliens had cured their genetic flaws so they could now pick up weapons and fight. That night, an impatient Machar sought out Emily, asking what she had experienced on the alien ship months ago. Emily looked confused, as if she had been through a dream. Poor Machar was brushed off, but Professor Bill and Zoe were not fooled. At dawn, they approached Emily, echoing Machar's doubts. Yet Emily remained clueless. 
Zoe was convinced Emily was hiding something. The circular tattoo on her arm suggested she might be one of the aliens. Otherwise, how could Emily have returned unharmed? Zoe suggested using the biological weapon on her to test its effectiveness, but Professor Bill flatly refused. There was no evidence to prove Emily was an alien, plus she was still an innocent giant baby. In reality, neither of them had any idea what Emily had truly been through. In the flashback, Emily met the alien leader inside the alien spacecraft, the very woman she had seen in her illusions. The leader was positive that Emily was one of their alien kin and insisted she return to the survivor's camp to assassinate Professor Bill, whose research on a biological weapon might pose a threat to the safety of all alien life. Faced with an incredibly tough choice, Emily was torn. She had always been a genuine human, or so she thought. Why then did she share this profound connection with the aliens? The professor was also perplexed by this mystery, and he stealthily plucked a few hairs from her comb for analysis. To his astonishment, Emily's DNA was identical to that of the aliens, plunging him into confusion. Meanwhile, Emily was on the verge of a breakdown as her empathic sensations with the aliens grew stronger, especially when she saw the corpse of an alien on the research table, feeling an inexplicable kinship and a burgeoning urge to kill. At the astronomical research base, Catherine and the guards were still searching for the alien lair without any progress. Just when everyone was at a loss, two soldiers entered, carrying an unconscious stranger. The medics rushed to assist, and Catherine found a notebook in his backpack filled with cryptic content. At that moment, the colonel noticed a tattoo on the stranger's arm and was shocked to discover he was an alien, causing immense tension among the ranks. The colonel demanded to know why he was there. It turns out the alien had escaped from their lair and been persistently pursued, but he was accidentally shot. With his last bit of strength, he reached the peak's snowy summit before passing out. Fortunately, he was found in time by two guards. Upon awakening, he asked the whereabouts of Professor Bill, but Catherine urged him to reveal how the aliens came to Earth. This alien revealed they were drawn by a musical signal. Still reeling from the shock, Catherine asked him why he was shot and why he was looking for Professor Bill. The alien answered that he was disagreeing with his people's approach to invading humanity and thus fleeing to seek the renowned professor to chart a path of coexistence. The notebook he carried contained advanced physical formulas which the aliens had used as a basis to develop space jumping technology. Catherine stared at the alien in amazement, feeling as though she had stumbled upon a treasure but wondered if things were as they seemed. Unexpectedly, the pursuing aliens draw near. A bullet pierced through the window, instantly taking down the nurse. A barrage of gunfire followed and the aliens swiftly charged into the hallway. A fierce battle ensued immediately. Catherine reacted quickly, grabbing her sister and darting through the back door corridor. The colonel, attempting to cover the sisters, was accidentally shot and killed. Only one soldier remained, forcefully dragging Catherine to escape in haste. When Calm returned to the base, an alien approached the bedside of his wounded comrade, clearly infuriated by the act of desertion. Without hesitation, he extended his hands and ended the traitor's life. From all the staff at the research base, only three would survive. Fortunately, Catherine hadn't abandoned her intention to defeat the aliens. The knowledge in the notebook was crucial. She had to find Professor Bill quickly. Unbeknownst to anyone, the professor was in the midst of a grave crisis. As the survivors in the school drifted into sleep, Machar saw Emily stealthily leaving the hall. Unexpectedly, she was preparing to strike at the professor. Luckily, he awoke just in time to prevent her from inflicting a fatal wound. Machar rushed over, stopping Emily from doing something foolish. After this disturbance, Emily's alien identity was established, and she was confined to a storeroom. Professor Bill was shaken by the close call. If something happened to him, his research on combating the aliens would be destroyed. Finally, he unlocked a secure cabinet and retrieved a new type of virus, an unfinished bioweapon designed to fight the aliens. He prepared to test its effects on Emily. Her eyes instantly filled with tears, seemingly filled with pleading. Bill reassured her that it was just a sedative. Then he forcefully injected the virus into Emily's arm. However, Emily quickly realized something was amiss. She had no strength at all and was breaking out in cold sweats. Professor Bill, the creator of the virus, had his own doubts and planned to take a sample for analysis. The results showed that the virus was taking effect. Emily's organs began to fail rapidly and Bill, knowing the lethal power of the virus on alien genetics, didn't want Emily to die. He stated that only by injecting insulin could they control the condition. 
Zoe was well aware that their insulin supply had already run out. A trip to the pharmacy was the only option. Before long, Machar arrived at a nearby supermarket with a group of survivors. They spread out, searching carefully, and finally located the pharmaceutical counter. After breaking the locks on the doors and windows, they began to rummage through the shelves in search of insulin. Machar, standing watch at the entrance with a child, heard a noise from the next aisle. Following the sound to the end of the shelf, he discovered a damaged robot dog. Although it was not a threat, Machar felt a bad premonition. Reacting quickly, he turned back to where he had been standing guard, only to find that the child with him had disappeared. In panic, Machar searched everywhere and saw the child's hat at the entrance of the supermarket. It was clear that the child had been captured by aliens. Fortunately, with the medication, Emily was no longer in immediate danger. But her family couldn't wait any longer. They hadn't seen Emily in a day. As it happened, when the aliens arrived, Emily's father, Jonathan, was in another city and had made a great effort to come here. Along the way, he met a woman and her son, Sacha. Surprisingly, Sasha could establish a connection with the robot dogs just like Emily could. With this living radar, Jonathan and his companions easily avoided the dogs and reached the downtown streets unobstructed. There they happened to run into Mashar and others who were out on an errand. Recognizing them from a photo as Sarah's husband, Mashar quickly led them back to the school building camp. The reunion between husband and wife was filled with immense joy. However, Sasha's mother, who had arrived with Jonathan, felt a bit out of place. It was likely that during their adventurous journey, they had developed some hormone feelings that went beyond friendship. When Jonathan learned that his daughter was imprisoned, he was furious. Yet Bill and Zoe stood firm, stating that no one was allowed to see Emily. With the majority of people there being Zoe's followers, the couple felt helpless and had no choice but to compromise. As Sasha shared a telepathic ability with Emily, he knew the situation was not as simple as it seemed. He quietly followed the professor and noted down the room where Emily was detained, but was powerless to rescue her at that moment. Emily herself sensed something was wrong. She remembered the alien leader mentioning that Bill was developing a virus against the aliens and immediately guessed what the professor had injected her with. Although the professor admitted it, she was now too weak to change anything. Her eyes were filled with despair, but would the aliens really just sit back and wait for their doom? The scene shifts to a desolate street where a frail figure struggled onward. The guard on lookout took a closer look and realized it was the child who had been captured by the aliens the day before. The survivors were all thrilled and quickly helped the child inside. Seeing the pain he was in, it was clear he had suffered significant injuries. They examined him and found a long, sutured wound on his abdomen. A man hurriedly opened the wound to check, but in the next moment his face turned ashen. A massive explosion nearly blew the hall apart, leaving everyone dazed and disoriented. But this was only the beginning. Countless aliens rushed in and began a frenzied slaughter of the survivors present. Professor Bill was desperate, knowing that all the virus samples were destroyed in the explosion. Now, the only hope was Emily, who carried the virus. But Sasha acted even faster. He rushed into the storeroom and helped the weak Emily out. Machar, Sarah, and their family knew the situation was beyond salvation. They escaped through the back door amidst the chaos. In less than an hour, the entire survivor camp was eradicated by the aliens. Fortunately, Professor Bill managed to escape as well, foiling the aliens' plan for this mission. The group navigated through the streets, eventually choosing to rest for a while in a mall. Emily was weak, but she still had the strength to speak. The professor had to admit that he had injected her with the virus to test its effects against alien weapons. Everyone was furious, especially her mother Sarah, who was almost driven to madness. However, Professor Bill was convinced he was in the right. He then took out insulin, claiming it could suppress Emily's symptoms. Surprisingly, the effect was immediate, and Emily improved that very night. Sasha hurried over to see her, marking their first official meeting, yet they felt an inexplicable familiarity, having already been intimately close in visions. Sasha felt that he and Emily were meant to be together. In contrast, Professor Bill became an outcast, with only Zoe still steadfast in her support. Although the virus was destroyed in the explosion, Emily was already infected. If they could take her to the lab to extract samples, they might still eradicate the aliens. Unbeknownst to them, Sasha overheard their conversation. Taking advantage of the quiet of the night, he approached the professor, believing that Emily would only be completely safe with the professor gone. The elimination of the aliens was not his concern. As Sasha drew his knife and advanced, the patrolling doctor suddenly rushed in. The two immediately wrestled their muscles, with Sasha stabbing the doctor. 
The professor seized the moment to run away, finally shaking off Sasha's pursuit by hiding in a dark corner of the street. Unexpectedly, the boy returned to where the doctor was wounded and only left the room after ensuring the man had stopped breathing. As dawn approached, Machar eventually found the deceased doctor. Panic set in among everyone. The killer Sacha acted as if nothing had happened, as no one suspected him. They searched the entire mall and found no sign of an outsider intruding, and Professor Bill had also disappeared. Machar suspected he might have fled out of guilt, but Zoe immediately denied it. At this point, her greatest concern was for the safety of the professor. At the same time, Catherine and her sister, in their quest to find Professor Bill, successfully arrived at a library. Since they didn't know the professor, they could only trace his location through the books he had checked out. Soon, Catherine finally confirmed that Bill was employed at a university in London. Although it was not certain that he would take refuge there, it was clear he wouldn't be far away. When leaving the library, Catherine specifically took a backpack from a body, showing the importance she placed on notebooks. The three of them embarked on an adventurous journey to London. Unexpectedly, they came across a solitary courtyard where they intended to find supplies, but heard the sound of a revving engine. Soldiers went into the garage and discovered an elderly man sitting in a car about to end his life. They pulled him out, and fortunately, he was saved in time. The old man had not suffered serious harm but had lost all hope for life, as all his relatives had died in the disaster. Even his remaining spouse had been killed by aliens a few days before. After hearing his story, Catherine felt deeply moved and invited him to join them in finding Professor Bill in London, a vision that could save the world, giving the old man a new sense of hope. The group of four got into the car, which was much more convenient than walking on foot. While passing through a forest, they heard cries for help and hurriedly got out of the car to investigate. They found a human tent under attack by robot dogs with only a little girl trying to escape, soon to be caught by the machines. Catherine wanted to help, but a soldier stopped her, pointing out the overwhelming number of robot dogs. In the end, they could only watch helplessly as the little girl was brutally killed. The group of four continued on their way. As they neared the city center, the main road was congested with abandoned vehicles, and seeing the decaying bodies on both sides, they felt sorrowful. Since the road ahead was blocked, they detoured to a dock where they were suddenly attacked by aliens. The car quickly broke down, forcing them to abandon it and hide among shipping containers. Unbeknownst to them, the aliens had prepared an ambush from above the containers. The situation was dire, and the old man was accidentally shot in the leg. They had to fight and retreat until they hid in a container. The old man, unable to run any further, told Catherine and the others to go on without him, otherwise they would all be doomed. The guarding soldier decisively handed him a grenade. Under the old man's cover, Catherine and the other two escaped the container area. Left behind, the old man, hearing the enemy's footsteps approaching, did not hesitate to pull the pin of the grenade. Catherine knew she had lost this newly made friend. The number in their party returned to three. In the city center of London, a large number of aliens are dispersed across every street, all busily searching for Professor Bill. An alien quad is heading towards Emily's hideout, determined to find the professor who developed the biological virus. Fortunately, Tom, who was on lookout, noticed early and rushed upstairs to alert everyone. They knew they couldn't exit through the main entrance of the shopping mall and had to take a detour through a side door. Along the way, they encounter a few scattered enemies, but Mashar can easily handle them. The group successfully escapes outside the mall, foiling the aggressive aliens once again. Without daring to pause, they continue across several streets until they reach a large bus station and decide to use it as a temporary base, though everyone knows this isn't a long-term solution. Zoe occasionally picks up the walkie-talkie, hoping to contact other resistance organizations. Tom feels somewhat hopeless, wondering if their group is all that's left in the city. Emily's situation is even worse. Her supply of insulin is running low, and she needs to resupply soon. The only people able to fight are Emily's father, Jonathan, and her brother, Tom. Without hesitation, the father and son quickly arm themselves and set out to find insulin. They soon arrive at a nearby hospital and agree to search separately. Jonathan successfully finds insulin in the medicine cabinet and plans to meet up with his son, but discovers that Tom has been captured by two aliens. Fearing for his son's safety, Jonathan reluctantly surrenders, disarmed by the aliens, whose clear purpose is to find out the whereabouts of Professor Bill. However, since Bill left the mall the day before, Jonathan has no idea where he has gone. As the aliens are about to kill Tom, Jonathan lies, claiming that the professor is nearby and offers to take them there. It's just a stalling tactic by Jonathan, who randomly points to a building, saying the professor is inside. 
One of the aliens believes his bullshit and hurries back to call for reinforcements, leaving only one member to guard the father and son. Jonathan waits for this opportunity. When she is distracted, he suddenly attacks, disarming her and then strangles her until she stops breathing. Only then does he have the chance to check on his son, who has been hit by a stray bullet. Jonathan is now in complete panic, helping his injured son back to the bus station, filled with guilt. Emily clearly senses her father's pain. She feels responsible for dragging her family into this situation and also recognizes the alien's ruthless killing. It's at this point that she starts to agree with Professor Bill's methods of eliminating the aliens and can't help worrying about his safety. Since fleeing the shopping mall, Professor Bill had been living a life of constant hiding. During one of his supply runs at a supermarket, he encountered a soldier by chance. After confirming that Bill wasn't an alien, the soldier took him back to his own dwelling, which housed two other soldiers who had fallen on hard times. Their squad originally numbered in the dozens, but after skirmishes with the aliens, only three remained. Their achievements were nonetheless impressive. They had eliminated a large group of aliens and even captured a prisoner. Bill was moved by the soldier's fervent spirit and immediately shared his background. He wanted to take Emily, who was carrying the virus, to the lab so that a biological weapon could be released to eradicate all the aliens. The squad leader was persuaded and decided to accompany him to the shopping mall where Emily was located. However, upon arrival at the mall's entrance, they discovered it had been occupied by the aliens. Bill returned to their hideout, filled with concern for Emily's safety. At that moment, from the next room came the agonizing screams of an alien. Bill stood up and saw someone beating the alien. One of the soldiers explained that the survivor beating the alien had lost his entire family to their hands, and today happened to be his child's birthday, so he was taking his anger out on the alien. Although Bill understood that these invaders deserved to die, his conscience told him that it was wrong to treat a defenseless enemy in such a manner. As night fell, all the soldiers were fast asleep. The professor stole the handcuff keys and rescued the bewildered alien woman. He observed her injuries and left the room, deciding to go out and find some painkillers for her. The refuge at the school he used before wasn't far, just across a block. Professor Bill returned to this familiar place, where the debris of buildings and bodies lay in stark contrast to the bustling sounds of the past. Collecting his thoughts, he found a walkie-talkie in the hand of a corpse, exactly what he needed. In the dead of night, using the walkie-talkie, the professor contacted Zoe, who had always supported him. He told her about the boy, Sacha, who had initially meant him harm and later killed the doctor. Then, he asked Zoe to find a way to bring Emily to the lab, planning to extract the virus and exterminate the aliens. Early the next morning, Zoe sent another message. She was planning to forcibly take Emily to the lab. The professor became rather agitated and decided to meet up with them, leaving the alien prisoner behind. When he finally reached his destination, he breathed a sigh of relief to find that the lab equipment was undamaged. By this time, Zoe was ready to take Emily hostage. She approached Emily when she was alone and threatened her with a gun, demanding that she go to the lab with her. Understanding Zoe's intentions, Emily was cooperative. She truly wanted to contribute to the eradication of the aliens, but Sasha was preparing to intervene. Zoe immediately revealed the truth about him killing the doctor, which made Emily know his malicious intent. The others, learning the truth, also understood Emily's stance and declared their support to go to the lab with her and meet the professor. Meanwhile, Catherine and her sister, who were searching for Professor Bill, had arrived at the school where he worked. But they found no one after searching all the classrooms and not even Bill's name on the register at the reception. Catherine was plunged into despair and had no idea what to do next. While drowning her sorrows in alcohol, she saw a light turn on in a classroom across the way. There was no doubt there were other survivors. The three of them immediately set off, crossing a square full of bodies, and entered the room with the flickering light. To their surprise, it was a large lab, brightly lit, but there were no signs of life. In the innermost part of the lab, there was a robot dog on an experimental table, and behind it lay a corpse covered in blood. Catherine turned her attention to the diagnostic equipment connected to the robot dog. The complex data on the monitors shocked her. After moving the man's body outside, Catherine began to examine the data from the robot dog. She noticed that some of the constants and formulas were similar to those in her notebook. It seemed that the man had been researching the behavior principles of the robot dog, which must have involved a considerable amount of alien technology. After a night of exploration, she discovered that the creature's processing system was like a super brain. Before a threatening action could even be completed, it could predict countless countermeasures, as if it could foretell the future. 
Sophia accidentally picked up a cell phone off the floor. She guessed it must have belonged to the man before he died, so she found a power cord and began to charge it. After turning on the phone, she discovered many videos stored on it, all of which were logs filmed by the deceased man. Her curiosity piqued, she began to watch them one by one. She learned that the man had survived the electromagnetic disaster and had been hiding in the lab ever since. One day, he chanced upon an injured robot dog and started to study it. He connected to the robot dog's control interface, intending to use the information he obtained to decode the dog's operational principles. However, he was stumped by some of the data conversion and couldn't make sense of it, which halted his research progress. Then, during an unexpected incident, his arm was pierced by the creature, leading to his death from excessive bleeding. After watching these logs, Catherine realized the data conversion that the man couldn't understand was likely to be achieved through the formulas recorded in her notebook. As she was preparing to re-examine the data, her palm was accidentally pierced by the robot dog, presumably the same way the man was injured. But Catherine was luckier. The injury was not fatal. This time, she understood all the analysis data and was shocked to know that these creatures possessed a brief ability to rewind time, which allowed them to predict an enemy's actions. This suggested that the aliens had mastered the technology to manipulate time. Recalling the words of the alien defector, Catherine surmised that these aliens didn't come to Earth through spatial jumps, but rather used time technology to travel here from the future. In other words, these aliens were from the future. Sophia was excited after hearing this, and she also brought good news. From the man's diary, they learned that the school had a branch in London, and Professor Bill was likely employed there. Without any hesitation, the sisters packed their luggage and set out again, convinced that this time they would definitely meet up with the professor. The three navigated through the apocalyptic streets, surrounded by a sprawl of corpses. Suddenly, they heard a noise ahead. It was the alien race collecting robot dogs. They treaded lightly, attempting to sneak by. However, Sophia was a bit slower and nearly got discovered by an alien guard. She had to hide temporarily in the trunk of a car. The guard, sensing something, started to open the trunks to check. When he got to the car where Sophia was hiding, she shot and killed him. The noise of the gunshot attracted other aliens, and the three of them had to run like wild gooses once again. They finally took refuge in an empty apartment, temporarily escaping the crisis. They couldn't remember how many times they'd narrowly escaped death, but the responsibility they shouldered quickly calmed their hearts. After a short break, the group set off again on their adventure. Incredibly, just as they left the street, they caught the attention of Mashar. A standoff ensued until they realized they were all there to help Professor Bill. Catherine and the others reached the lab to meet the long-awaited professor, only to find him with a face of despair, seemingly after a terrible event. It appeared that after reuniting with Emily and the team in the lab the previous day and starting the virus extraction, lab tests revealed that the virus needed a specific medium to work. To defeat the aliens, Emily had to go deep into the alien race and infect them with the disease. Initially resistant, she was convinced by the professor to stand with humanity, mainly to prevent her family from dying at the hands of the aliens. But before the plan could start, Emily suddenly felt weak and sick, like she had contracted a disease. Her mother, Sarah, quickly called Bill to check on her. After analyzing Emily's blood, the professor looked gravely concerned. The virus was rapidly multiplying in her and even insulin might not help. Zoe was confused about this sudden change, but Professor Bill explained that Emily's pregnancy had weakened her immune system, allowing the virus to infect her. Zoe's focus was on the mission, hoping to get Emily to the alien lair before she died. Meanwhile, Sasha, the boy hiding in the dark, foresaw Emily's death and rushed to the place she was staying. He snuck past the guards and finally reached Emily's room. Seeing her dying state, he was furious, suspecting the professor was to blame. Under the threat of a gun, Professor Bill revealed the truth about Emily's pregnancy and the deadly virus. Sasha grew even angrier, knowing that Emily was pregnant with his child and decided to take his love to the alien spaceship, believing it could heal her. To provide better care, Sarah chose to go with them. Sasha knocked the professor out with a few punches and headed towards the alien spaceship. It wasn't long before the unconscious professor was revived by Jonathan on patrol. Learning that his daughter and wife had gone to find the alien ship, Jonathan was ready to chase after them, but the professor stopped him, explaining that as long as Emily was near, the virus could be transmitted to the alien population. Watching the plan nearing fruition, the professor visited his wife's grave, remembering the promise he made to her to destroy all the aliens. 
As the group arrived at the docks, they caught sight of an alien spaceship preparing to dock in the distance, only to be stopped by an alien guard. Upon learning why Emily had come, the guard shared that the spaceship could heal her, but only if they revealed Professor Bill's whereabouts. Sarah was not about to comply and pulled out a gun. Out of nowhere, a gunshot sounded from behind and Sarah fell, shot by Sasha. In his determination to save Emily, he was ready to remove any obstacles, despite Emily's desperate struggles. She was forcibly taken aboard the alien ship and strapped into a seat, unable to leave. Meanwhile, Catherine had opened up about her research to Professor Bill, suggesting that these aliens might very well be from the future, though their exact intentions remained unclear. As they were deep in discussion, Sasha's mother was suddenly shot in the adjoining room. The aliens had launched an assault, no doubt after Sasha had leaked their location. The professor had no time to flee, so he hid behind a lab chair. The aliens scanned the room and proceeded to search elsewhere, leaving only their leader behind, evidently looking for something. Bill took her by surprise, knocking her out and then demanding Emily's whereabouts. The leader smugly revealed she had anticipated Bill's plan and had already arranged for Emily to be isolated in a spaceship. Once the ship ascended, she wouldn't be able to infect any aliens, with only the alien guard as a casualty. Hearing this, the professor panicked and rushed to regroup with the others, who knew there was an escape route by the back door. After securing the main door, they made their escape, but it was too late. The alien spaceship at the docks was already lifting off, and all they could do was watch helplessly. They left the docks in utter dismay and sought refuge in an apartment. During a conversation, the professor discovered that Sasha could communicate with the aliens and suffered from a genetic muscular atrophy, which sent a shiver through him. The aliens' genetic mutations had similarities to Sasha's condition. Furthermore, considering Emily's congenital blindness, Professor Bill got to know that Emily and Sasha were actually ancestors of this alien race. Both had congenital genetic disorders that caused genetic mutations in their descendants, plaguing the entire race with disease. This was the reason they had traveled back in time, in search of a cure. However, with Emily and Sasha already aboard the ship, Professor Bill realized they had missed the prime opportunity to eradicate the alien race. Catherine then recalled the peaceful coexistence proposal from a renegade alien. This could be a potential breakthrough, but the notebook's contents were too complex, even for Professor Bill to decipher. Seeking the alien race's assistance seemed to be their only remaining option. In the spaceship, Sasha learned the full story through the control panel. Emily, however, was determined not to let the tragedy repeat itself and saw only one way to turn the situation around, to end her own life. Sasha ensured the ship was stocked with ample food and water, resolved to continue their lineage. In the deserted streets of the city center, aliens were clearing away rotting corpses, the piles of which had grown as large as a small hill before incinerating them completely. Clearly, the aliens believed they had thoroughly defeated humanity, yet Professor Bill had not given up. After lying in wait for half a day, he finally managed to rescue an alien prisoner who was the wife of the defector alien. Professor Bill disclosed that her husband had been killed by his own kind because his vision of coexistence with humans was not accepted. The girl, filled with doubt, went back to confront their leader. The leader, confident of imminent victory, admitted to having the rebel alien killed and revealed plans to exterminate all other races. Realizing the leader's cruelty, the girl decided to do something to redeem herself and her husband. That night, she contacted Professor Bill, indicating she could activate the time portal her husband had left behind, believing that only by returning to the past could they alter the current situation. Professor Bill couldn't help but worry that it might be a trap set by the aliens. When the appointed time came, the girl told her people that she and Bill were meeting at the mall opposite. But when everyone entered, there was no one in sight, and the girl had vanished without a trace, having deliberately lured the aliens away. She met the professor, explaining why her husband had been seeking Bill. It turned out that the notion that Bill could annihilate their entire species had been passed down from the first generation of aliens. But when her husband realized that the alien race was on the verge of extinction due to genetic diseases, he decided to take a different path, planning for Bill to intervene and save the entire race. To fulfill this plan, he had left a cryptic clue about a time portal in his diary, with which his wife was extraordinarily familiar. The girl then led Professor Bill to another alien spaceship. Unbeknownst to them, the alien people had anticipated her idea and were lying in wait at the entrance to the portal. Catherine volunteered to cover their escape, but died at the hands of the aliens. Bill and the girl successfully entered the interior of the spaceship. 
After a series of complex maneuvers, the professor activated the time tunnel. A dazzling white light shone, and suddenly, Professor Bill found himself on a hospital bed, once again seeing his child who had passed away. It was apparent he had successfully traveled back in time. The hospital was abuzz with activity. It appeared to be a time before the alien invasion. Coincidentally, Emily and her family had also come to this very hospital for a visit. Bill knew this was a golden opportunity to change the future. If Emily were to die, the so-called alien invasion would never occur. The professor casually concocted an excuse and lured the unsuspecting Emily to the rooftop. Without any hesitation, he pushed her off the edge. In the moment before her death, Emily's life flashed before her eyes, but it was all destined to be nothing more than a fleeting illusion. The next afternoon, Professor Bill was on pins and needles in his office. The time of the predicted alien attack was fast approaching, and he was uncertain whether killing Emily would indeed alter the future. Catherine, who was the first to detect the alien invasion, was monitoring signal changes as usual. Fortunately, several hours passed without any sign of the aliens. Upon waking, the professor was overjoyed to discover that the time of the alien invasion had passed without incident. The world of humanity remained unchanged. He excitedly ran to the streets where he saw his wife, the woman he had longed for. When Mashar emerged from an oil tanker, there was no apocalyptic scene to be seen. He returned home as usual for a warm embrace with his mother. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.